Let's get to my United Football League power rankings ahead of week three action. And for the second week in a row, we had some outstanding UFL games that came down to the final play in many instances, but somebody got to win, somebody got to lose. We're going to start at number eight and work our way to number one as we continue to march through this 10-week season to the playoffs and crowning our first UFL champion. Number eight, the Houston Roughnecks are 0-2. C.J. Johnson's squad looked like they knew something for the second week in a row going up to Audi Field play the DC defenders came up a little bit short. I thought it was really cool to see Reed Sinnott come in there. That's a dude from San Diego. That was also with the Cincinnati Bengals last year, pick up where Jaron Quarantano left off and ended up going pretty good. 19 to 30 for 221. Like, I mean, one of those incompletions is the final play of the game, but they had opportunity to go get it. I thought that once again, Ruben Foster turned out to be a dude is a dude might be the best defender in the United football league, but 0-2 after losses to Memphis and now a loss to the Defenders. They got to get it right in a hurry if they expect to be one of those two teams representing in their conference. Number seven on the list, got the Arlington Renegades. I right, Look, Bob Stoops' team had it until they didn't have it. And for the second week in a row, the defense looked like it's getting stunted on. Like I'm looking at this and I'm wondering to myself where it went wrong for the Arlington Renegades because Coach Stoops was actually wrong in his post game when he said, look, we weren't that good on third down. Y'all were pretty damn good on third down. As a matter of fact, uh, be better than the St. Louis battle Hawks you lost to, but also we're talking about a team that went three for three in the red zone for scoring and a quarterback in Luis Perez that understands what he is doing. One of my favorite things about the United football league is the mic'd up quarterback because the mic'd up quarterback, he'd be talking like I'd be talking when I'm loud because he knows what he is doing. He knows what he wants and everything is just getting at him real quick, fast in a hurry. And he's having to yell back at the offensive coordinators and the offensive coordinator is yelling back. And I really enjoy this dynamic between Chuck Long and Luis Perez who be in somebody's headset. Talk about, Hey, we're running this. Don't call run, run pass. They're calling out run pass on here. I really enjoy knowing that a quarterback like Luis Perez can make a living in spring football the way he has playing in all four major spring football leagues, being the King of spring, but also they got to, they got to get back on the good foot. Like this is a team that is actually six and eight since they returned to XFL competition in 2022 and somehow up and won the XFL championship last year. Now I love coach Stoops. Y'all know this. I'm in the bag for Coach Stoops, but but I, I can't do no 0-2. But when you're playing in front of the crowd that they were playing in front of in St. Louis, it's just going to be difficult. Maybe they can get it right when they get back to perhaps stopping people from scoring because that's all it is. If you can stop people from getting in the end zone, I think the Renegades are up and running because they can score with the best of them. Now, number six, I got the Memphis Showboats, who had the worst loss for a spring football team that I have seen since we returned to spring football in 2020, like this one was, this was a heartbreaker and this one was dramatic. And it was even more dramatic with the mic'd up segments of this league. I really enjoy listening to coach D Filippo going up and down the sideline, keep coming back to his defensive coordinator, Carnell Lake with 48 seconds left to go against San Antonio. Brav is going, do you want the timeout? No, I'm good. Do you want timeout? No, I'm good. He must've asked Carnell Lake if he wanted the timeout four times for Carnell Lake to say, no, I'm good. And then they get out there and they gave up 20 points in the final quarter of a game they were leading 19 to zero and 12 points in the last minute of the game is tough out there for them. But you know what? Maximilian Roberts looked really good coming off the edge. He had two sacks in that game and a forced fumble. Case Cook has had 252 total yards, but that's just a game you have to finish. If you're the Memphis Showboats. one, you're a good football team and you were winning that game in every way you needed to win that game up until you lost it. Like I'm talking about the first half, we're talking about a San Antonio Brahmas team that ran more plays than it had total yards. They were going nowhere fast. And because of the nature of this sport and the nature of these rules, they gave themselves an opportunity to go snatch a win when they should have taken a loss. Coach Filippo called this one of the most disappointing losses that he's ever been a part of. He is a man that takes losing personally. He puts everything he has into a football team. I think the Memphis Showboats are going to figure it out. But one and one, I expect them to be two and zero. Oh. We'll see how this goes the rest of the way. Number, what is this? Five on the list for me. Yeah, Michigan Panthers also one and one. I thought EJ Perry was doing a pretty good job, all things considered. It looked like he lost his job for a little bit. They put in LSU quarterback Danny Etling. Danny Etling went out there and did, well, not as great a job as EJ Perry was doing. They put EJ back in there. 
and he ended up really giving them a shot to win late. Now, outside of all that, I could point to you, he was running for his life because he was, right? They gave up seven sacks. That offensive line can't give up no seven sacks. And you got to get more out of your run game with a guy like Wes Hills back there because I think that could be the best tailback in the league, but he is not, right? And I think that's got to go, Mike Nolan, you got to go up to your offensive coordinator and go put the ball in his belly. And then let's get EJ Perry into some second and shorts, some third and shorts, and maybe run some play action stuff and do a little bit more of that 1990s pro style offense because I think y'all could do it. However, all you got to do is get it past 50. All you got to do is get it past 50 because the best kicker in the league is on your football team. The Birmingham Stallions got to say this the last couple of years with Brandon Aubrey, who made a training camp, Dallas Cowboys, came at all pro set an NFL record for a consecutive field goal makes with 19 in his rookie year. And then they got this found money named Jake Bates. So for the second week in a row, Jake Bates hit a field goal from 60 plus 64 in week one, 62 in week two. And he's only kicked three field goals since high school. All of them in the United football league. And he is three for three, 64, 62 and 53 leg for days. And Mike Nolan has to know this. Now, I've already heard from three NFL scouts going, he's going to be at a camp. It's just whether or not I get him in my camp or their camp. And again, found money because this is a man that was brought in to kick the ball deep, not to kick field goals because he was all SEC as a kickoff specialist at Arkansas before going to play soccer for a little while, coming back in the United Football League because, well, we moved the ball back and we like to be able to kick the ball as far as we possibly can. And then they put him out there basically with the half ending in the first week, and he went nailed from 64 yarders, making him the first professional football kicker to make 60 yarders in back-to-back weeks since Brett Maurer did it for the Dallas Cowboys 2019, week six and week seven. And for those of y'all that are paying attention, Justin Tucker hit from 66 at Ford Field. Hello? Jake Bates hit from 64, and it looked like he would have been good from 70 on both occasions right through the middle. Somebody's going to pay that man a lot of money to kick footballs in the NFL. Number four on the list, we got the D.C. Defenders. Jordan Tamu is still one of the better quarterbacks that we've seen over the last couple of years, three years, honestly, in spring football. But it was very clear that they needed a running game to help supplement what he can do through the air. They got 11 points in the final quarter to win the game against the Houston Roughnecks. But at times I was looking at this going – Y'all need to get out of y'all's own way. And I could see why this team was 9-1 and one last year. When they got it rolling, they got it rolling, right? When when you got your offense coordinator and Fred Kyes absolutely in his bag with Jordan Tamu, you got a chance. When you got Greg Williams running a bare front in the first half because he knows you can't stop it, you got something. I think Reggie Barlow really wanted to get back home. How he filled his absolute advantage. I think it's the second best atmosphere in spring football right now, and that really did pay dividends. Tamu put together second consecutive 200-yard passing performance and was averaging better than 12.7 yards per pass. Again, just got to supplement that with a pretty outstanding run game, and I think you can be in that XFL divisional, right, for the conference championship and maybe get to the UFL championship game. Number three on the list, I got the St. Louis Battle Hawks, led by one A.J. McCarron. I got to remind people, it's not just that A.J. McCarron was on an Alabama team that won a national championship is that A.J. McCarron was the first team All-American at Alabama. We forget that. And then he shows up at St. Louis and he's absolutely out there dealing. First week in the dramatic loss to the Michigan Panthers, he was ruining the decision not to put the ball in his hands, saying, hey, we ain't been able to run the ball all damn day. Give me the football. In week two against the Renegades with the game on the line, that is what Anthony Beck did. He gave him the football and that man marched him down the field, tied up with a tie game at 24 all and got them in uh, position for Andre Smith to make a, what is this, 23-yard field goal for the walk-off win, right? In front of a spring record crowd of 40,000 people. Guys, that's a lot of people for a spring football game. And this ain't new for St. Louis. This is what they do. They were averaging 35 last year. They sell out for pro football in St. Louis, Missouri. So anybody that got to go up there to play a football game, yeah, you up against it because you're going to hear those fans getting at you on third down, on fourth down. It is the best home field advantage 
in spring football today. And when you can draw like they've been drawing, yeah, you're always going to be in a football game, especially with these unique rules that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But I think the St. Louis Battle Hawks absolutely could be at uh, here at the end of the season playing for something. And not just that, they could be playing in front of a home crowd. You imagine they're going to play the UFL championship game at St. Louis. Imagine if the Battle Hawks are playing in that game and you are the USFL team. I'm telling you, you're going to be playing against the 13th man out, 12th man out there, because we only have 11 on side, 12th man out there in these St. Louis uh, fans. Cause law, I'm I'm not all with it, but that's what y'all do, so I'm going to let it ride. Cause law, fine, we can do that. Number three, or excuse me, number two on the list, I got the San Antonio Brahmas, one of two undefeated teams in the United Football League after two weeks, had a dramatic win that featured a Hunter making his third read to the center for a trick play for TD in week one. But also Chase Garbage was outstanding in that game, right? Uh, really shocking the defenders with three total touchdowns. And then saved his best football quite literally for the last quarter. And more specifically, for the last five minutes of the game. Chase Garbage went out there and said, hey, give me the ball. Watch what I do with it. They go score. And in the UFL, if you are trailing in the fourth quarter and you scored, you can opt for a fourth and 12 play from your own 28-yard line. If you convert it, clock keeps running, and you got to go through it. So they got their points. They went and took that option from the 28-yard line. I saw Chase Garber throw this ball short of the sticks. That dude made a play to get upfield. And we're continuing to roll. And Garbers is absolutely losing his mind in these mic'd up chants. Like at one point, he's yelling back at his offensive coordinator talking about, no, they were blitzing. I'm killing it. I know what I'm doing. Give me the play that I want. And I'm going, that's that's a guy I want out there playing quarterback for me. Right? If I'm an offensive coordinator and about running my play, it's about making me look good. That's that's the whole bit. Chase Garbers out there making A.J. Smith look good. Look like a bacon and egg sandwich. Look good. And then number one on the list is the dynasty. It's the Birmingham Stallions. I, what Skip Holtz has been able to do over two plus years at Birmingham is ridiculous. Okay? And I, like a booger, I'm going to stick to this. They have won everywhere they have played. Peep game. They go on the road as the defending USFL champions to start the first and second week of competition. And they get W's. One, at Arlington, and then San Antonio. Oh, excuse me, San Antonio, excuse me, uh, uh, Memphis, Michigan. I'm looking around, and I'm going, who's going to stop them? And then I'm reminded that DeMarcus Gates didn't play in week one, so they got him back for week two, which means they got Scooby Wright, Kayaba Tizino, and DeMarcus Gates playing at linebacker. And then you got Taco Charlton coming off the edge. <laughs> yeah, Michigan defensive end Taco Charlton. They had seven sacks as the quarterback in that game, man. E.J. Perry out there running for his life. But also, Skip Holtz's two-quarterback system continues to work. Like, he's done this from the jump. Like, he had last year Alex Magoo and Jamar, Jamar Smith, and they both did that in 2022. This year, he's got Matt Corral and Adrian Martinez and Jamar Smith on the headset. And he's getting everybody the same amount of playing time, saying they're both going to play. They both deserve to play. It's fine. Usually, if we if you have more than one quarterback, we say you don't have one. But both of those guys are capable runners. Both of those guys are great decision makers in the pass game. And I was having a lot of fun watching two dudes that were stars in the 2018 recruiting class go to Ole Miss, go to Nebraska, and then Kansas State, make it into the USFL uh, team that is Birmingham Stallions playing the first year of UFL football. And out there just making it happen, right? C.J. Maribel also making it happen. Deion Kane out there making it happen. I'm enthusiastic about this team, but now that they get to play their first game at Protective in the United Football League season, and we've seen the gauntlet thrown down by St. Louis, and as far as who's showing up for what, y'all better pack Protective. That's all I'm saying, you know? Like, y'all got an image to hold up. Y'all, Birmingham was the host city for every USFL team, all eight of them, 2022, all right? Last year, best home atmosphere in the USFL. I know because I spent time in Birmingham the last couple of years watching these games. I'm curious to find out just who shows up, how good the atmosphere is, and whether or not they can keep this dynasty rolling. That is the Birmingham Stallions. All right, those are my 
power rankings headed into week three football. Let's go to my MVP rankings heading into week three of football. And we're going to start at number four, and we're going to work our way up here. I say four, we had five because sometimes we we might have three. I, I didn't see five guys that I need to put on this list. But I'll tell you what, the quarterbacks continue to shock me with some of their outstanding play. And, you know, given what it is, I totally understand how hard it is to play quarterback in the United Football League. What I think many of us fail to understand is how hard it is to play it given what people know about you from what they can already hear. So I'm curious to find out after the first couple of weeks if these change because we're going to hear your calls on a microphone on YouTube. Then you got to change it up. Then you got to make a play. All right, so let's get the list up. And let's start at number four and work our way up. So at number four on my UFL power rankings, I'm going to start with Arlington Renegades quarterback Luis Perez because, well, 21 to 29, 72% completions, 233 yards. I think the stat that stuck to me was he ranked second in the UFL in passing, but first in yards per attempt. And I thought that was remarkable given that, well, he ain't had much of a run game to speak of. And while I want them to get one sooner rather than later, he's also very clear about where he wants to go with the football. And he's being very honest with Chuck Long in between these play calls and what he wants and what he sees. And I think Chuck Long is trying to go along with it and give him what he wants because they understand that. He's also been able to keep Lindsey Scott on the bench for most of the first two weeks. And Lindsey Scott was outstanding in college. Like I was really excited to see that dude throw the ball all around the yard. Cause that dude that went 4,600 yards, you know, in route to making a playoff appearance in the FCS. And yet Luis Perez like, nah, man, I won that championship Texas AM commerce. I played four professional spring leagues. I know what I'm doing. Number three on the list. I got Mateo Durant. My goodness. Uh, first 100 yard running back in the UFL. I don't know if he knows that. I don't know if they pointed that out. But I was I kept looking for a hundred yard tailback because I'm thinking offensive line has never been better in spring football, at least the last three years. It hasn't been better. You should run behind it. And they got Mateo Durant out there. Also, I man, I forgot dude went to Duke and dude set the single season rushing record at Duke his last year, 2021 over 1,200 yards. He's bounced around, but I think he's found a home with St. Louis. And I think that if AJ McCarron can trust him, you can do some dynamic things with those two guys on play action and really moving the football keeping it on schedule. And then number two on the list, I got AJ McCarron, also St. Louis Battlehawks. He is, I think with Luis Perez, one of the most respected quarterbacks in the United Football League. It's a man that, like Reed Sennett with the Houston Roughnecks, spent last year with Cincinnati Bengals, asked for his release so that he could go play for St. Louis because he's got young kids and he wanted those kids to watch dad play quarterback. Same thing is true with DJ Swearinger. That dude played nine years in the NFL. It's like, what are you doing in the UFL? My kid ain't never seen me play football. It matters. It matters because it's one thing for us to be like, yeah, dog, I was cold in high school. It is another thing for you to go out there and do it on national television, like out there living the dream. Yeah, I'd ask for my release too. So I go 19 of 29 for 248, two TDs and no interceptions. Again, AJ McCarron is that dude. He expects to get St. Louis into that title game this year. And then number one, I got Chase Garbers. Uh, That dude's been money. For two consecutive weeks, 29 to 40, 287 and three TDs with one pick in their come from behind win against Memphis last week, 20 to 19, had three total TDs in their first outing. He understands the offense. He is running it the way that A.J. Smith has envisioned it. And again, mic'd up segments are some of my favorite, like just memeable moments. Uh, at one point out here talking about, nah, I'm killing it because he was. He was he was killing the play, but he's also killing it on the field. All right. Speaking of which. Let's go talk to Chase Garbers about what it's like to play for the San Antonio Brahmas and what he expects for his future, specifically this year in the UFL. I'm pleased to be joined by San Antonio Brahmas quarterback Chase Garbers. Chase, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm good, brother. I get to talk to a man that's 2-0 and through the first two weeks of the United Football League, and y'all have a knack for just putting on exciting games and my goodness, I think the most exciting one that I've seen since I've been starting covering spring football three years ago. I want to start with going into the fourth quarter, right? You're down 16 to zero. When did you believe 
that you could lead that team to a comeback in a game that, frankly, y'all were never in until about the last eight minutes. Yeah, well, we knew offensively we just had to get one score on the board, and we knew we can get things rolling from there. Um, you know, we got that first score, started the fourth quarter, um, and we knew that we had a shot to win this game. Um, and then just things kept rolling our way. You know, we came down and score again and then got the ball back on the fourth and 12, which was uh, very interesting for our first well, time. I want to stop you there because you had you, you had the pick in between this, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking it's 425 left to play. I want to know what your thought process was after that pick going the other way. It's, I think that's the second turnover of the day for you. How, how were you feeling about the game? Uh, well, I knew, you know, th obviously throwing that interception sucks, uh, given the, them the ball back with, you know, four minutes left. But, you know, football, four minutes, there's there's a chance we can get the ball back. And, you know, and our defense did a great job in getting us that ball back. And, you know, obviously we knew we had to go put up two scores to win the game. You're on your own 15. You're minus 15 with 235 left to play. And I'm looking at this game going, all right, you got a shot here. And as a quarterback, that's what you want. Just give me the ball with enough time to go make a play. and you find Cody Latimer, which gets me into kind of how this offense runs because you run it like a fast break. You run it like a point guard. So I was curious when you're going out there, do you know that, all right, I'm going to try to find three. And if I can't find three, I'm going to try to find 13. Uh, not so much that mentality. Just, you know, the awesome part about this team and this skill group is we have so many weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, you got Cody, you got John Trey. You got, you know, Stevenson, you got Smith. I mean, you got all four of them are, are huge playmakers. They can do a lot of great things when they have the ball in their hands. Um, and, you know, Cody was rolling that game. You know, John tried some catches early on. So I think, you know, just for me, it's getting the ball into my playmakers' hands and seeing what they can do with it. So you get that play made. I thought it was going to be a big explosive play, even bigger than it was. But uh, it got called back because down by contact. You continue to roll, though. And that's the thing that. I wanted to know from you, how do you continue to keep yourself focused on the game with these big plays that continue to happen for the last two minutes of the game? How are you locked in? I think, you know, it's just a one play at a time mentality. You know, obviously in a scenario like that, you want to get chunk plays. Uh, I think we did a really good job of doing that to move the ball down the field. But I think, you know, even though there's big play after big play, you know, your emotions aren't running too high. You still know that you got to put points on the board. Um, so I think for, for us, it was just a one play at a time mentality. So to that fourth and 12, one of the cool things about the UFL is if you're down in the fourth quarter, you can opt to go for a fourth and 12 from your own 28 yard line and play, make it, take it down. So it's one thing for you to get that fourth down, which forward progress being your friend there. And then you're on the ball, right? Talking about one play at a time. Are you getting the call from AJ as you are running up to the line of scrimmage, or do you know what adjustments you're already looking to make? Yeah, I mean, the great thing about, you know, this league is a majority, normally all the skill players have, you know, a headset connected to AJ. So we're all getting the call as we're running up to the line. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't think it, that fourth and 12 was as close as it was going to be. I thought we had it by a yard. But, um, you know, as we're running up to it, we're getting a call and we're lining up for the next play, waiting for the refs to, to spot to spot the ball. I kind of love just how in tune you are with what you see, because you will also give it back to your play caller going, no, no, I saw it. I got it. Send me the next play. Right. Yeah. I'm really interested how that translates on a football field when everybody hears what you're saying. Right. When you're talking about the other skill players can hear, do they look at you and go, all right. Chase knows where he's going. I better be where I'm supposed to be. You even got, I call it a fake play call, but I heard uh, GTFO and O standing for open. Are these sorts of conversations you're having at practice too, or is this just how you guys talk to each other? Uh, well, that's actually a, a real play call. Um, yes! Sorry, <laughs> I just love that. But um, yeah, I mean, that was the final play of the game. But I think, you know, just those conversations that we have, you know, the ability to listen to what AJ's saying on, on all levels, uh, sometimes it does cut in and out. So, you know, they are looking for me to to get them in the right spot. But I think that's, you know, one of the good things about this league is that you have that technology at hand. This league has done a really great job of giving us access to you guys and also kind of making stars out of these players. And I'm thinking of you because you you play at Cal right, which is already West Coast, and we already got some feelings about what was Pac-12 after dark. And then you're coming up during this period that also features COVID. So I'm curious how much football you were playing, 
right? Between 2021 and now, because I believe he didn't start a game until this year after December 2021. And what do you think this league allows for you to do from a quarterback standpoint? Yeah, I mean, you know, after my last game at Cal, there wasn't a lot of of playing time, you know, got some runs in preseason in the NFL, but, you know, really that was pretty much it. So, you know, it was great to to play a full game of football again. Um, and I think what this league allows, you know, guys like myself is to to play in a full game, get the tape out there and try to make that jump to back in the NFL. Played for a number of different offensive coordinators, learning a lot of different offenses. You're running a run, an old school, I call it old school, run and shoot, which is, hey, we're going to put the man in motion. We're going to fix to fit. And then we're going to run the play, right? I wonder how much you have to trust guys like John Trey, guys like Cody to see what you see or how much you have to dictate, hey, this is what they are doing. We're going to adjust this route on the fly. And how much room do you have to operate as quarterback? Well, with this offense, you got to have a lot of trust in your guys because there's so many adjustments that, you know, one individual can can run um, in terms of route running, you know, depending on what the defense gives us. Uh, so that's, you know, with the limited time we had in training camp, building that trust, building that chemistry, you know, that was obviously huge. Um, and yeah, there is there is a lot of freedom in this offense. And I think, you know, you see stuff on the sideline, you make those sideline adjustments going forward to the next drive. And, you know, this offense is really fun to, to play for. It's fun to watch as well. Like, I, I don't think that AJ is, uh, shall we say, not innovative. Some of the things you guys are running out there, I'm going, okay, you're actually having fun. How hard is it to pick up the offense? And then when he throws fun at you, how hard is it not to just want to run that over and over again? There's definitely a lot of fun. You know, Coach AJ brings a, a lot of fun to to the play calling, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, just normal plays or trick plays. Um, and I think, you know, it was it was pretty easy to pick up because we we do have, you know, virtual reality technology here, which was very helpful for us uh, early on, uh, especially, you know, installing the offense. So, you know, it it's 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 good football. And then also there is the fun aspect of it as well. You got the St. Louis Battle Hawks coming up. They're coming to you, right? They're going to be at the Alamo Dome. What have you seen just early on that you know you have to look for from that defense? Well, you know, I think they're really talented. They're really stout up front. Uh, you know, they played a really good game, you know, last week against Arlington. And, you know, they probably should have won their first game if it wasn't for the the 63 or 64 yard field goal. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's going to be a good game. You know, we're 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 hungry. You know, we wanted to play better in the first half of our last game. So we're going to clean some things up and and come with a complete game plan. And, you know, overall, I'm really excited to play a talented team. Yeah. You're playing right now uh, at a time when little brother Ethan is going through it with the new head coach, Deshaun Foster, right? UCLA. I'm wondering how much conversation y'all have about just how the process is working out for both of you, two highly rated quarterbacks coming out of high school, both West Coast guys, and still very much uh, in yeah. our mind's eye playing the sport. Do you get to talk with him about what it is that you've learned uh, being a professional at this level, as opposed to what he's going through now being the guy as it is at UCLA. Yeah. Ethan and I talk a lot, you know, not so much right now because he's in spring ball and I'm in the middle of a season, but you know, I think for him and even for myself, it's been great to to have somebody else kind of going through it. Um, you know, myself being the older brother, he's, he's asked a lot, you know, especially being a four-year starter in college and, and having the opportunity to play in the NFL, kind of what to expect now that that he is the guy. And, you know, they are they went through a coaching change kind of late in the cycle. And, you know, they're really excited about Coach Foster and what they got this year. And I think, you know, playing in the Big Ten now will be uh, very exciting for him. My last one for you, and please take this any direction you want to go. Why did you want this opportunity to play in the United Football League? Well, I thought it was a great opportunity to play some football. You know, it's something that at a high level, uh, obviously, it's something that, you know, we all dream about playing football is, you know, trying to make it to the highest level possible. Um, and, you know, I thought it was a great avenue to have an opportunity to possibly make it back into the NFL. Um, and, you know, that's ultimately where I want to be. And, you know, since the first day I knew this league had a lot of talent, you know, you see the names on these rosters um, and then you see it week in and week out, you know, we're only in week two with, uh, you know, a handful of weeks left, but there's a lot of talent in this league. And I think, 
you know, ultimately it is, it is really good football and it's a, it's a great league. Chase Garbers will lead the San Antonio Brahmas on the field against the St. Louis Battlehawks, one of the two undefeated teams left in the UFL. Chase, thank you for taking so much time and giving us your time here on the number one college football show, talking about your experience in the UFL. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's going to do it for our UFL show on the number one college football show. My thanks once again to San Antonio Brahma's quarterback, Chase Garbers, for joining us and wish him well the rest of this season. Number one college football show leads of screening are Jack Coakley and Torn Westfall. They make us better in the film room. Additional support from Kiara Santana and Jim Cunningham put the special in our special teams. Producer JV on Duncan makes sure the recruits and the rivals see the cake we bake. Technical director Niles Owens sending in the signal. Senior producer Catherine Cordaggi sees the entire field from the booth. Lead producer Tyler Wojak calls the plays from the sideline. The play snaps on my clap. We'll be back here live talking college football next Tuesday. Until then, stay low. Keep those feet driving. Deuces.